So we're going to talk all about shoulder stability. And sometimes the shoulders can really give you the shits. But we're going to show you how just a little bit of sex can fix that shoulder. According to science. <laughs> Why wouldn't you want to listen to this episode? <laughs> <laughs> TM <laughs> Well what are we going to talk about today anyway? Scapulas Scapular instability huh. we, Well we, we thought of, I, When we talked earlier what, Yesterday or something I said what do you want to talk about this week Graf? And I mean guys sometimes we don't know what we're going to talk about Until the moment we sit down mm. And we go what are we going to talk about? And I said, you know what, I'm pretty sure it's in our, in our show note, like our blurb, one of the elephants, mm. scapula instability. Mm. And we haven't, we haven't done an episode on it. So let's do an episode on it. Scapular instability. Instability, what a Pilates buzzword, hey? I think, uh, well, when I, when I was a kid, back with Stop Pilates, yeah. it was called scapular stability. Right, okay. The, the in was silent. <laughs> Um, so, yeah, I think this is a concept that, that a lot of people in the Pilates world and even in like the sports and physio world are kind of obsessed with a little bit. Um, and also that people think is kind of a, the shoulder, the shoulder girdle is kind of a complicated scenario and a little bit mystified by the whole thing and possibly intimidated by, you know, worrying about it. Um, so hopefully by the end of this episode, We'll talk you out of that and you'll be talking off the ledge and you'll just be like, hey, or whatever, just just get moving, do a few push-ups. <laughs> Who cares? Uh, okay. Yeah. Great. So what's what's the elephant? The I well, I guess the elephant is that if you don't stabilize the scapula, aka the shoulder blades. Bad shit happens. That you're going to have I, pain and injury, I mm. feel like, mm. is actually the mm. what what's linked to mm. to that. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I yeah. think um, yeah. There's a whole. I mean, that's what I was taught that the scapula needs to be to sit in a certain spot. You know, and when back in the stop Pilates world, I was taught that it needs to sit. You know, between T three yeah, and T seven. We, pa- we palpated the spine yeah. a bit, didn't we? And we. Three to five centimetres from the <laughs> spinous processes is descending, depending on the size of the individual. I always, always remember thinking, the medial really is vertical and parallel. What I think yeah. I'm feeling, I don't know. We've probably got some, has this guy got, yeah, he's got yeah. scapula. <laughs> yeah, they're kind of immobile though because they're, they're yeah. fixed on with <laughs> screws. Um, yeah, so yeah, so we were taught, we're, you know, and maybe the in whatever system of Pilates you grew up in, dear listener, you were taught a different set of rules about what the scapula is meant to do and not do. But, you know, basically the, the, the thing is there's a set of rules. We learned a set of rules. And so that it's meant to be in a certain placement and it's also meant to move, meant a, to move certain a certain way. way. Yeah. And, and uh, yeah, so the kinematics of it need to be very specific and even and... Great use of the word kinematics. Yeah. Thank you. When you say that, it makes me think, did I get it wrong? Yeah. No, <laughs> no kinesio means movement, yeah. right? So it's, kinematics is like how it moves. Yeah, it's like so that would have been a cheer. You should have done there. Oh, cheer! <laughs> that made me feel good about myself. See, you've given me a dopamine hit. Yay! Long learning retention. I'm gonna re. Awesome. Thanks, Raf. Um, so <laughs> yeah, so the I think the you know to really kind of dig down or or, or think uh, more clearly about. You know what you said there about uh, the the elephant is that basically if you if your scapula is not in the right place or doesn't move correctly, air quotes, you get injured, mm. right? Well, I think there's there's basically a causal chain of reasoning there, and there are several assumptions in between A and A and Z there, mm. and so right uh, there's and so basically the the assumptions are that in your shoulder joint that is the joint between your humerus, your arm bone, and and your scapula. And the, the joint there is called the glenohumeral joint because it's the, anyway, it doesn't matter why it's called that, but it's the glenohumeral joint. It's the, the ball and socket, and the ball is the head of the humerus. Yeah, and the, the socket is the bit on the scapula. And then it's kind of over the top of that joint, there's a little shelf of bone called the acromion, which is the other end of your scapular spine, right? The scapular spine protrudes out beyond the end of the scapula, and it's called the acromion. And so the shoulder joint is this ball and socket joint 
and the ball's the head of the humerus and the sockets and the scapula. And then it's got kind of a little roof over the top of it called the acromion. And in between the top of the humeral head, you know, the top of the ball, in between the top of the humeral head and the bottom of the acromion, there's a space. And it's called, very, very imaginatively, the subacromial space, you know, the space underneath the acromion. Um, and when uh, in that space is the tendon of the supraspinatus muscle. Right, supraspinatus is one of your rotator cuff. It lives in the above the scapular spine, and the tendon goes under the acromion there and over the top of the humeral head. And so, what the the the, the chain of logical kind of in inferences in that idea that if your scapula is in the wrong place or, or moves incorrectly, there's injury. Is okay when you raise your arm up. The humeral head kind of rolls back in the socket, and the humeral head is not a perfect sphere. It's got kind of lumps and bumps that poke off it at different spots. And if there's not enough space in between the acromion and the humeral head, when the humeral head rolls back, one of the lumps or bumps basically squishes that infraspinatus tendon up against the subacromial bursa, which is just above it, and then up against the acromion ultimately. And so what that does is it irritates the supraspinatus tendon and the subacromial bursa. And then you get an itis, which means inflammation of the, of the supraspinatus tendon or subacromial bursa. And then you get an osis, and then you, which just means something wrong with the tendon. Then you get an opathy, right? And so people come along and they have diagnoses of subacromial bursitis, subacromial bursopathy, uh, infraspinatus tendinopathy, rotator cuff tendinopathy. Sometimes the tendon frays. And then they get a diagnosis of rotator cuff tear. So all of those things like rotator cuff tear, rotator cuff tendinopathy, tendinosis, tendinitis, blah, blah, blah. Itis is an itis is an opathy in your shoulder. All fall under that ba banner of, okay, well, if the humeral head banged into it, that's what hurt it. And it's thought that if your shoulder girdle rolls forward, then when you raise your arm up, that's when the humeral head bangs into the acromion. So... That's why we got this idea that your shoulder girdle shouldn't roll forward. It should roll down and back. Mm. Yeah. So all of those inferences are the ones. And most of those turn out to be not true. That's the thing. Mm. Well, one of my favourite uh, takeaways from Adam Meekin's um, course, uh, Complex Doesn't Have to Be Complicated, which was about the shoulder complex, um, was he actually just all of those things you just said, he puts it together in an acronym called SHITS. Mm, something hurts in the shoulder. Something hurts in the shoulder. That's the diagnosis, is it? Yes, SHITS. And this is like he is he specialises <laughs> in shoulder, mm -hmm. shoulder rehab, yeah? Um, something hurts in the shoulder. Mm. Yeah, SHITS. Mm. It's a goodie. It's a great one. It's a great one. So that's the end of the episode. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. That was one of our best yet, Raph. <laughs> Something hurts in the shoulder. Off you go, guys. Yeah, don't worry about it. Um, it's not a thing. Okay, <laughs> okay. I'm guessing we're going to go. A bit nah, deeper. just oh, just, just joshing. Just you. Yeah. joking. <laughs> so, all right. So, so the first. All right. So, the, so there's a whole series of assumptions. The first assumption is the scapula has a proper position, right, and a proper set of movements, right. Second one is that we can detect it, right. So if I look at your scapula and move like, oh yeah, no, that's too high or too low or too this or too that, right. So we can actually C kind of the same that we can just visually ascertain if someone's uh, pelvis is, you know, yep. anteriorly <laughs> tipped or, yeah. or rogue, like, yeah. yeah. Come um, on. So, all right. So, number one, okay. there's a right and a wrong position. Number yep. two, we can tell the difference by looking or palpating. Uh, number three, if it's in the wrong position, that actually causes a problem. Mm. Um, number four, if it's in the wrong position, it causes a problem. Can we use exercise to put it in the right position? Mm. Number five, if we'd use exercise to put it in the right position, does that change anything right so all of those kind of assumptions are yet to be tested and luckily many of them have been tested and short answer is the answer is no but let's go through some of the details <laughs> so um firstly in this idea of identifying um uh you know the the position of the scapula like you know can can we reliably tell if someone's scapula is in the right place or the wrong place and if you're out there and you've been trained in this you're thinking like hell yeah i can tell from 10 meters away well what i'm what i'm going to tell you is like no you kind of think you can it's kind of like when i was a kid i used to think i can always see when a man has a toupee right 
you ever notice when a man has a toupee on, like a you know a bad kind of wig that doesn't quite sit right, right? And I'm like, every time I see a guy with a toupee, I can I can pick it, right? But then, like after after years and years and years, I realised like, oh hold on, what about the guys with toupees that I don't pick, and therefore I don't know they're guys with toupees. Uh-huh. <laughs> right? yeah. So the only ones I know that I pick are the guys with toupees are the ones that I notice, right? I wonder might. if toupees are getting better because I must admit I haven't noticed mm. a toupee in a really, really long time. Either people aren't wearing them anymore mm. or they've got better. Maybe, maybe we're doing hair replacements now or something like that instead. Mm. Yeah. Anyway, nothing against toupees or I'll hair replacements. I'll probably see them all over the place now. That you yeah. know when, when you've – Right. I'll be focusing but on the it. The thing <laughs> is like when we think we're seeing the scapular dyskinesis or scapular instability, dyskinesis is what they call it in the, the literature. Like dys means not and kinesis means moving. So it's like not moving properly, right? Mm-hmm. So uh, scapular dyskinesis or scapular instability, as it's more colloquially known, like we think we're seeing it, but what about all the times we don't see it? And what about all the times we think we're seeing it when we're not really seeing it? Mm. So um, what there's this study which I've got in front of me by uh, Plummer et al. from 2017. And what they did was they got um, two groups of uh, patients. Some of them had shoulder pain or half of them had shoulder pain, half of them didn't have shoulder pain. Um, and then they had physios, uh, two groups of physios, look at these patients, right? Look at them sort of do arm movements and and look at their shoulder, you know, and decide whether they had scapular dyskinesis or not. And one group of the physios weren't told anything about the patients or just like, here's a person, watch them move their arm, tell us if they've got scapular dyskinesis. And the other group of physios were told, oh, this person's right shoulder is sore, right? Have a look at their arm and see if they've got scapular dyskinesis. Uh, I know, right? I can... And guess what? Guess where <laughs> this is going. Well, what, what do you reckon? What do you reckon? So, so obviously, obviously they, they were like the ones with pain have... Right. So significantly, they the physios who were told like the power of suggestion. Yeah, the physios who were told that the person had a short shoulder (laughs) significant, you know, rated them as significantly more dyskinesis, yeah. you know, like dyskinesis. Yeah. Yes. So so if your client comes into you and goes, oh, I've got a sore shoulder, and you're looking at, oh yeah, it is kind of moving funny. It's like, yeah, maybe they just mm-hmm. placeboed you. Oh, you do know? you know how many <laughs> times I've had that done in Pilates assessments to me over the years? Because I when I stand, one of my shoulders just naturally sits visibly higher than the other. That like the amount of Pilates instructors that have just freaked about that, like, oh my God, that's the worst thing ever. You must have pain in that shoulder, don't you? I'm like, no, no, you must have pain in that shoulder. We're going to work on that. No. (laughs) Most people have one shoulder higher or lower than the other. And apparently I think it's a dominant shoulder that's often lower. I don't know why. I don't know. I don't care. Dominant shoulder that's I don't even know if that's true. I read it somewhere. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, like we think we can tell when someone's not quite stable, but it's like, can you really? Mm. And the answer is, yeah, probably not. And so. I want to really challenge this notion of stability as well, but I'm guessing you're going to do that a little later on. Um, so I won't yeah, go down well, the stability there, rabbit hole Well, yet. there are a couple, there are, there are a few kind of researchers here. So, you know, tell me what you, what's on your mind about that. Uh <laughs> A genuinely unstable shoulder is a, is a shoulder that um, dislocates, mm. a dislocating shoulder. Mm. That is the only time a shoulder is genuinely unstable, mm. right? Mm. Just because one of my scap does something than the other or whatever or one of my shoulders is higher than the other or et cetera, et cetera, has got sweet FA to do with... Shoulder instability. Yes. Like, like it's, it's, it's the wrong word to use. Yes. And I, I want to scream that from the, <laughs> the top of the building. Stop telling your clients mm. they've got things in their body that mm. are unstable. Mm. It's not cool. Mm. And it's just inaccurate. It is. It's both uncool and inaccurate. Yeah. Yeah. Because in biomechanics, unstable means doesn't return to its equilibrium point when it's disturbed, right? So someone who dislocates, that's an unstable shoulder. Yeah. Right? But if you're not dislocating regularly, your shoulder's plenty stable. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, yeah, it's just not a good image for people to have. 
It's and I feel like we have actually we've spoken about the word using the word uh, still stabilize still in, of, in other yeah. episodes mm. and sub out with still if you're mm. if that's the intent if you're asking someone to keep something still instead of saying mm. stabilize that part of the body mm. use the word still mm. better better still <laughs> come up with some external cues so actually last night uh, in our um, fearless movement tutorial with our wonderful November Cert 4 crew we had a big discussion around the word stabilize mm. and why we shouldn't use it and what could we use instead and oh my gosh they came up with the they had me in like a bird dog position so they used me as their body where was the cat and <laughs> crawling around underneath me it was very he cute. wasn't stable it was very cute <laughs> malibu's already in the tutorials and very welcomed by everyone um but what i loved is they even came up i said so yeah you could ask me to keep something still but what if i already think i'm keeping that part mm. still right from a motor learning perspective what if i already think i'm keeping that part still they were throwing amazing external cues at me left, right and centre, things I hadn't thought of. Mm. So you just got to – got to stop. you got to think about the impact of your words and there are plenty of other options to get the same movement outcome out of someone if that's what you're going for. Mm. Yeah. Mm. you just got to stop and have a little think. Mm. Yeah. Mm. Anyway, moving on. Um, yeah, so uh, there are – there are, there are several bits of literature on looking at, like, is there such a thing as scapular dyskinesis or the, the layperson's term is instability, and, and is it related to pain? Um, and so there's one systematic review from uh, Hickey et al., I think it was, um, that in 2018, which found uh, the headline was scapular dys dyskinesis increases the risk of future, sh future shoulder pain by 43% in asymptomatic athletes, a systematic review and meta-analysis. So they kind of give away the punchline in the, in the, in the headline there. Um, but when you look into the uh, – and I'm sort of like paraphrasing a, a response by Chris Littlewood, who's a researcher in the UK, shoulder researcher in the UK here, where basically when you look into the guts of this study, it's a systematic review. They only had five studies included in it. So this is not very good literature mm. in this area. And – um, four of them measured scapular dyskinesis one way and the fifth one measured it a different way, right? And so it's always hard to compare apples with apples mm. when you're comparing things that aren't measured the same way in the original research. And so when they removed that study, so that study that measured it in a different way, they had to kind of like convert what they found and sort of convert it statistically into a different thing to make it match up with the other studies. Um, and within the... the, the this review by Hickey et al., they say, okay, if we remove that paper from the from the pool and just go with the four papers that were measured the same way, there's the the result is not statistically significant, right? It's the result is not statistically significant. In other words, the error bar crosses zero in a statistical sense, right? So basically it's 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 the whole result of the paper hinges on this one study, right? which is not a good basis for drawing a conclusion with the study in. It's like, whoa, increase it by 43% with the study out. It's like, oh, no association whatsoever. So a good systematic review, Raf, how many, like on average, how many, how many, like, would there be in there? How many? Uh, well, how a many? good systematic review, it's not necessarily like how many. Raph, it's, it's like the quality of. The it's research. the quality of, it's how many, and it's the agreement between the research, right? Right. So when you've got a, a pool of research in a field where by just removing one research paper from the entirety of the field, right, you change it from 43% increase of injury risk yeah. to no correlation. Wow, okay, right? yeah, right, yeah. <laughs> that says that there's just not, we, it's not a settled question yet, mm. right? We just don't have enough information to draw firm conclusions at this point, mm. right? So, you know, the headline in this paper could equally have been no association between <laughs> scapular dyskinesis <laughs> and sh future shoulder injury in, a, in asymptomatic athletes. Yeah. So, yeah, so we'll po I'll post the, the, this article and also Chris Littlewood's, because uh, I'm just paraphrasing what he said, um, Chris Littlewood's kind of response to it in here. Um, Chris and Adam... Uh, I don't know. The UK is a small place. They must know each other. Yeah. Um, uh, so, 
there's there's also a, a systematic review from 2013 by Ratcliffe et al. called Is There a Relationship Between Subacromial Impingement Syndrome, which is like what we talked about right at the start, like all of those itises and otises and opathies that happen in the shoulder, shits, right, um, and scapular orientation, a systematic review. And what they concluded was, quote, currently there is insufficient evidence to support a clinical belief that the scapula adopts a common and consistent posture in scapular impingement syndrome, end quote. So, uh, and that was from 2013, so it's you know, seven years old now, but it's, um, you know, that, that's, that's kind of the second best bit of evidence that we've got on this. Um, so, yeah, I think there are, there are, there are, there's not really clear evidence that there is such a thing as scapular dyskinesis and that it's related to shoulder impingement in the research. So, I mean, we could just stop there. Well, we don't know that shoulder <laughs> impingement's a thing either, do we? No, well, that's the sure thing. it's not a thing. Well, all of those, all of those other, you know, uh, links in that kind of chain of inference, like, okay, the scapula has an idealised position. Well, does it? We don't really know. Um, we can detect whether it's in an ideal position or not. Can we? <laughs> Apparently not that well. Yeah. Um, and... Uh, is that, you know, is is it being in the quote wrong position or moving wrongly associated with pain? Well, maybe, maybe not. Not, not don't really know. Mm. Um, but then all of those other inferences, like okay, when you move the humerus wrong, it jams up against the blah 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 tendon and blah blah blah. And so, well, what we find is that a few trials recently, there was there's there's a there's a, a trial that came out in 2017 in the Lancet that looked at subacromial decompression surgery versus sham and yeah. so this is where because of this whole you know set of logical kind of inferences that we have that the humeral head is jamming up against the supraspinatus tendon and the the subacromial bursa up against the acromion because there's not enough space there right because your shoulder's in the wrong spot that you know well you go and have a surgery where they shave off the bottom bit of the acromion so they make more space there right so it's called an acromioplasty you know, like you have a rhinoplasty on your nose, you have a chromioplasty on your chromion, they shave off a bit so there's less acromion, right? So there's more space, yeah. right? And so you'd think, well, if the thing's jamming into the thing and you shave off a bit of the thing, there's like, there's more space. Yeah. And what they did in this trial was they randomised people to receive either a chromioplasty or sham acromioplasty, where they literally just gave them a general anaesthetic, did a skin incision, rinsed it out with saline, and then sewed them up and woke them up and said, congratulations, the surgery was a <laughs> marvellous success. <laughs> and they found at 12 months follow-up, they were identical outcomes. Mm. Least, like no difference at all, right? So a craniaplasty surgery works exactly the same as placebo, right? Which is to say it is a placebo, mm. right? It's just a sham. It's just a placebo. Mm. Um, so that really casts doubt on the whole mechanism. So of it's a sham, it's a placebo, but you're also got the added risk of Infection going under anesthetic, and anesthetic and exactly, all of that. Exactly, yeah. or the healing time, yeah. Um, yeah. The rehab. It's an expensive and dangerous placebo. The, yeah, mm. yeah, wow. Um, yeah, so that, I mean that really casts doubt on that whole chain of inference, right? If we can shave off the bottom of your chromium, it makes no difference compared to just pretending to do it. <laughs> like, yeah. And I think too, um, you know, because I, I remember back, back in the day when I – First learnt to be Pilates instructor and absolutely I learnt all about the kinematics of <laughs> how the scapula should move and whatnot and remember doing things like palpating a client and kind of like, you know, sort of coaxing their their scapula into a kind of different position. Mm -hmm. Does that feel better? Is that Yeah, that feels better. Oh, yeah, that feels better, mm -hmm. right? And thinking, okay, cool. So that's like the optimal position mm -hmm. for that. Mm. And uh, again, in in uh, Adam's course, and guys, if you've got it, if you're into this stuff and you've got a chance to do um, Meeks's uh, the shoulder shoulder complex doesn't have to be complicated. I highly suggest doing it, and particularly now it's online. It's like a a day course, two day course. Um, and in that, he actually showed this great. And I feel like, oh, oh gosh, or oh, was this in Greg Layman's? Sorry, this is in Greg Layman's course. Everyone, st stop. Stop booking. Don't do Meeks's course. Do Meeks's no. course. <laughs> do Ben Cormack's course. And also, these are, Raph and I have done all of these courses. Yeah. We love them all. And also do Greg Lehman's course. Um, what's Greg's called again? Reconciling Biomechanics with Pain Science. Yes, which is also online. And Greg's a great friend of Breathe Rich Education. Awesome. Yeah. Like, we love he's all of a, those three He's guys got a love. brain the size of the universe, but he's also a comedic genius. He is. Yeah. Out of all of their – and I loved all of their courses – 
Greg was the funniest. Yeah. I'm just shout out to Greg. You were definitely the funniest. Um, and anyway, I adore all three of them. But this was actually, I'm sure Greg played in these because you're going to remember this. So there was, it was a big, you know, uh, uh, there was a physio. He was on stage. Uh, no, it was, a, it was a surgeon. It was an orthopedic surgeon. Okay. Yeah. Do you want to tell the story then? It sounds like oh, you might remember he's it better just, than He's just looking at the scapula okay, and looking so at the patient move. So and, there's a guy, yeah. a young guy comes out. He's a young guy and he's um, got shoulder pain. But, you know, he's young. Maybe he was a tradie or something, if I remember correctly, right? And, yeah, visually you can kind of see... The surgeon's saying, oh, look where his scapula, it's wrong here and this one's not moving properly and see this and see this and see yeah. this. Yeah. So, this, so the surgeon does all kind of this woo to, the, to this one side, to this one scapula, right? And, and at the end, he turns and he goes, to everyone, so you feel better? And the guy goes, it was the other shoulder. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> and he's just done that in front of like a huge audience. Yeah, it's one of those just excruciating faulty towers like it moments. Was, it's yeah. so faulty towers, right? So it's just I just want to cringe and go no. Was, hope the earth swallows me up. It was just comedy yeah. genius, is what it was. But it's like, <laughs> and the poor, guy, the poor young guy's just like, eh, it's the other shoulder. Mm, yeah. <laughs> um, so. What should we be doing, Raf, instead? So we've now determined that, okay, it's not a thing. Mm. Let shoulder blades do what they're doing. It's not, there's not a correlation with um, shoulder blade posture and uh, pain, injury, etc. There's not uh, a correlation with instability of the shoulder because that is a different thing altogether altogether it's got nothing to do with this so pilates instructors that are out there going but oh gosh this is a big oh, part of so what, what I, do we what do we do for is, shoulders now you know this is a big part of what i do in my initial assessment with my client and then i program it in for them and well, we work that, on it isn't this great that you can not not waste any more time on this with your clients and you can talk about their goals and what inspires them and what they want to do you know all of that and just get them moving but what? I can hear the, the Pilates instructor is like, but my client has come to me because they've got shoulder pain and they want to get out of their shoulder pain. Oh, well, what do you do for shoulder pain? Is that the question? That's the question, yeah. right? Well, um, there's got to be an acronym like SHITS that <laughs> is basically some kind of exercise for the shoulder. Oh. So like sex for the shoulder. <laughs> some kind of exercise. <laughs> yeah. I think, I think like, I'm, I'm going to copyright that. <laughs> Sex, note sex that, for the shoulder. <laughs> note that, Julie, everyone. <laughs> Raphael Bender has just copyrighted that. <laughs> yeah, sex for the shoulder. Sex okay, the that's shoulder. that's my new method oh. of shoulder rehabilitation. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea that that's where this podcast would end up going today, guys, and that is the, the beauty of this uh, <laughs> dialogue unfolding. So, Raph, um, <laughs> would you like to explain your method? <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, it's... it's um, it's very complex. <laughs> oh my um, and there's lots of nuance to it. Right, no, so, okay. <laughs> all right, so there, there's a lot of research. So there's, there's a lot of research, even though we've got these extremely shaky underpinnings about is scapular dyskinesis an actual thing and is there an actual difference in a craniohemoral distance, like the, the space under the acromion, with people with shoulder pain and not, and the answer to that is no. There was a recent systematic review in 2020 that found mm -hmm. no difference in the subacromial distance there. So all, even though the theory underneath... 2020. Yeah, 2020. It's uh, Park et al. 2020, the, guys. That's very, very... And the title okay. is uh, No Relationship Between the Acromiohumeral Distance and Pain in Adults with Subacromial Pain Syndrome, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis from Park et al. 2020. Um and so that's just another nail in the coffin of the whole notion of scat of shoulder impingement, which is not a term that we use anymore. Um, we use ro rotator cuff related shoulder pain, or my preference is shits, something yeah. hurts in the shoulder. Um, and so, uh, what there, are, even though there, are, there's just really basically the whole theoretical underpinnings of like rehabilitating the scapula to be more stable have been undermined by this scientific research. There's still shitloads of research in like, oh, how do we rehabilitate the scapula? Right? How do we retrain these scapulas to be in a, a better position? Um, and so there is some, uh, there's conflicting research about whether you actually can change the position of a scapula, right? So some studies find like, oh, we did strengthen the scapular muscles and we stretch this and we blah, blah, blah. And now look, the scapulas are in 
scapulae are in a better position. And other studies were like, oh no, we did all those same exercises and the scapulae didn't change position. So it's like, it's not really clear whether you can in fact change the position. Um, but uh, when we put scapula retraining exercises up against just general shoulder strengthening and stretching, right? So we have two groups of people, both have shoulder pain, same age, same gender, same socioeconomic status, blah, blah, blah. And half of them get scapular focused exercise, you know, posterior tilt, lower trapezius strengthening, serratus activation, rota- blah, 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 you know, all of the things, all right? All the things. Um, all the complicated things. And the other ones get freaking push-ups and rowing and some pull-ups. Yeah. <laughs> um, gen- a horizontal push-pull, a vertical push-pull. Right, half. and a generic kind of set of stretches like you'd get down at the local YMCA from the most junior member of staff there. Right? Yeah. Just like total generic shoulder exercises, <laughs> right? Um, and we have those two groups. What we find is they both improve with no – differences between the groups right they both improve to the same degree so what that suggests is that exercise works exercise helps these people and what kind of exercise you do doesn't really seem to matter you know so scapular retraining does work it just doesn't work any better than any other form of exercise so it's it's just kind of like this overly complex and convoluted you know method of just giving someone shoulder exercise when they could just do some push-ups and it would be just as good. And with the more complex exercises, is there any, and the more, you know, specific, help, help. Specific. Thank you. (laughs) Well, no, I was going for specific, I'm going for a bigger word. Specificity. Thank you. That's what I was trying to say, which I blatantly can't today. Um, Kid and brain, everyone, kid and brain. Um, uh, Was there more of a chance of, uh, no SIBO in there, or uh, n- not, or reliance on someone else to give I them those exercises. I haven't, exercise I haven't, help I haven't found any curious. studies that looked at that. Okay. Usually, these are like really mechanistic studies that just look like two groups. Right, right, right. One gets scapular exercise, yep. one gets general, general exercise. We'll see who gets better, and yep. the answer is they all get better the same okay. amount, right? Um, and they uh, all get better at the same time. Like it's all just very yeah, same, 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 same. 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 Okay. Um, and my favorite study, like there are many, many studies, and I'll link to a bunch of them in the show notes. Um, but this is my favorite study in this area. It's by Chris Littlewood, who's one of my favorite researchers in this area. Um, and he, uh, it's called. Uh, it's from 2016. Uh, sorry, 2018. I'm sure it was 2016. Maybe I got it wrong in my. Um, oh yeah, no, that's why I'm looking at his rebuttal. That's wrong. That's the wrong paper. Um, what I'm looking at for is Littlewood 2016, yes. All right, so it's called a self-managed single exercise program versus usual physiotherapy treatment for rotator cuff tendinopathy, a randomised controlled trial. So what they basically did was they had people with rotator cuff tendinopathy, which remember is one of the kind of conditions that fall under the umbrella of shoulder impingement, which is caused by scapular dyskinesis, right? So it's just like it's a version of that. Um, and so And they divided them into half, and half of them got usual physiotherapy, which could be anything the physiotherapist wanted, right? So this was like two or three visits a week. They could do, you know, exercise, movement retraining, posture education, manipulation, electrotherapy, dry needling, taping, like whatever the physiotherapist deemed necessary, right? Or any combination of these things. Mm-hmm. And the other group got a single self-managed exercise to do at home. Like, so they had one session, the second group. And the exercise they got was like, okay, show us the most painful movement for your shoulder. Right. And they're like, okay, here's a TheraBand. Now do that movement with a TheraBand. That's your exercise. Right? So the exercise was not chosen to strengthen particular muscles or move the scapula in a particular way. It's just like do the most painful movement against resistance and that's your exercise. Okay. Right? And they were shown – it was the self-managed part comes in. They were shown that it was meant to – the symptoms were meant to settle after they – worked right so for they it was so painful that it was like blown up you know painful for two days they had to regress it make it easier and if it wasn't painful enough like it wasn't a five out of ten pain they were told to add resistance they were showed how to do that so they got to self-manage the resistance so that it was like painful enough but not too painful Mm -hmm. and what they found was guess what same fucking results everyone got the same results right they all improved the exact same amount right except one one group had like five times the amount of treatment that the other group had or 10 times the amount of treatment they had like two or three sessions a week for for six weeks right and the other group just had one session and if they're a band 
right? So, And was one group asked to experience more pain? Yeah, one group was specifically told to do their painful movement. Yeah. Like they were trying to provoke pain. Yeah. Right? And they were not given any corrections about their scapular position or anything. It was just yeah. like do the most painful movement. Uh -huh. That's your exercise. Uh -huh. Over and over and over. Uh -huh. Three sets of ten. So was this study trying to also see – that it's okay, like, was this a study about also that it is okay to yes, provoke to work into pain? Work into so, pain. That, yeah, they yeah. looked at several things. So, is it okay to work into pain? And the answer is, yeah, it seems to be totally fine. Yeah, right. Can we do, can we in one session in a TheraBand, can we get the same result as we could in 12, you know, one hour sessions with a physiotherapist? <laughs> the answer is, yes, we can. Right. <laughs> right. So, so what that says is that all of that fancy schmancy, you know, shit that the physiotherapists are doing is not adding any additional value mm. beyond what the person could just do with the TheraBand by themselves at they home. They didn't have another group as well, did they, that were that basically did nothing? And no, they, but... Because I like those where you can see yeah. whether it's also, could it have just been regression to the mean? Uh, or yeah, yeah. did they actually need the exercise to stimulate mm. getting better quicker? That's, they're the yeah. ones I like. Uh, all right, well, I've got a really great study here on that called... Um, well, I've got two actually. One is which patients do not recover from shoulder impingement syndrome with either operative treatment or non-operative treatment. Um, and what they found was basically um, they look at, in any randomised, most randomised controlled trials, there's a, there's a no treatment arm, mm. right? So if you look at like trials for surgery for rotator cuff repair or whatever mm -hmm. usually I have one group that has surgery and one group that gets a waiting list right right and then we look at the people on the waiting list we look at people who got mm -hmm. surgery so who gets better outcomes right um and so what these people did was they basically got all of the data from the people on the wait lists for these shoulder pain survey shoulder pain studies right so it could they could have been comparing it with surgery or corticosteroids or exercise or whatever but they didn't get the active groups they just got all of the data from the from the control groups right the groups that just got no treatment yeah. Right, and so they were trying to figure out what's the natural history of rotator cuff related shoulder pain. Right, if we do nothing, what happens to these people? And what they found was they basically all got better within twelve months. Right, and that the outcome of twelve months was basically the same as the outcome of twenty four months. So we don't need to follow them for twenty four months, mm -hmm. but you know whatever improvement is going to happen happens within twelve months, and so the majority of them improved. You know, basically within twelve months. So. Yeah, so the natural history is a significant factor in these situations, and if you just if you just leave it alone, it's probably going to get better, right? Give it give it about a year, mm. right? Yeah. <laughs> and if you have surgery, it might get better a bit quicker, mm. but it's not going to get more better. Mm. So I think uh, a lot of this comes down to managing clients' expectations as well, mm. and you know, um, having a, a, a realistic expectation for your clients. Mm. It's like. Yeah, you might still have discomfort for however many months, yeah. et cetera, mm. as opposed to, ah, oh, you'll be better next week. Because mm. uh, I think that that actually, knowing that I was, I was speaking about this um, actually just last night, this, that, that topic uh, with the November crew, because we were talking about tissue healing times. Okay, and I was explaining to them that that knowing your tissue healing times is important as well because you can actually uh, it can be empowering for your clients. And I gave an example of one of my clients who um, really fit fit young woman. Uh, she was snowboarding, um, dam injured her ankle, did quite a lot of ligament tendon damage, was in a moon boot, the works. Anyway. Uh, she was, I remember this day she was in my reformer class and she was still getting some discomfort in that ankle and, and uh, didn't have quite the same ROM as the other side, so range of movement, when we were doing some sort of plantar dorsiflexion, basically flexing and, you know, <laughs> flexing and pointing your, your foot. And she said to me, I really, it was a really distinctive moment. She said to me, oh, I'm injured now forever. Like, this is it. This is it. And I said, oh, I said, let's have a little, let's have a little chat. And I said, where, where are we at now? And she was about six months post the injury, okay? Now, I know my tissue healing times and tendons and ligaments, well, they take longer. They could take up to 12 to 18 months depending on the amount of damage that was done, et cetera, you know, how much progressive loading you're doing to help stimulate, you know, the rehab and so on. And I said to her, I said, you know what? I said, 
you, A, you're doing freaking awesome and you're doing exactly what what we need to do to progressively load your your ankle back to back to strength and and back to range of full range of movement and you're still within your tissue healing yeah. time so it's totally normal that you're still having uh, not quite that amount you know the same amount of rom as the other mm. side and you might still have some discomfort and she looked at me and she said why has no one ever told me that yeah and and I said I, I don't know and she said I feel so much better now i'm mm. so relieved and and that was so empowering for her mm. uh, so it's managing clients expectations can actually be really empowering mm. she thought that she should not have any discomfort yeah. pain or and and i think that we think that you know a lot in pilates as well like we think like any kind of pain or ache or or niggle in our body is like the oil light going on in your car which means like oh shit you better stop driving now and, and do something about it Whereas in reality, I think, you know, aches and pains and discomforts are just a normal part of everyday life. And you just kind of ignore them and <laughs> keep going about your business most of the time. Crack, crack on, as, uh, as Adam Meekins yeah. says. Um, it's like, who hasn't had a bit of a stiff neck in the morning sometimes? Or Well, or, we've become yeah. a society, and this, this is probably, uh, this, is a, for, uh, this would be a great another episode when we talk more about pain. But, I mean, we have become a bit of a society that is pain and discomfort adverse, yeah? yeah? The first sign of some sort of niggle, we pop pop the, the Panadol or the Nurofen. Am I allowed to mention brands on here? I don't know. But, we, you know. That would be um, uh, Paracetamol or Ibuprofen. Yeah. Um, you, yeah. You, you, you pop a painkiller, basically. What do they call it, Panadol you? and Paracetamol in the US? They call it uh, – it'll come to me anyway. It's got yeah. a different name. Yeah, um, so, you know, and we have we – have as. I, I think we have become quite pain adverse. Yeah. And yeah. and what you said about, you know, getting back to what you said about psychological kind of impact of, on people of, you know, their expectations. Yeah. Actually, it's got an impact on their recovery. Um, and in uh, the last thing I'd, I'd like to share is this um, trial by Chester et al. 2016 called Psychological Factors Are Associated with Outcome of Physiotherapy for, sh- for People with Shoulder Pain, a multi-centre longitudinal cohort study. And I think we've talked about this one before. Mm-hmm. But they looked at basically, um, they had um, about 800 or 1,000 patients in this was pretty big trial mm. and they all had shoulder pain and they looked at a bunch of stuff at baseline, like 71 factors, you know, like the range of motion, strength, pain levels, body mass, you know, a bunch of other stuff and some psychological factors. And then they followed them for a year and they saw who got better and who didn't. And what they found is that none of the physical clinical tests had relationship with with their eventual outcomes the the thing that predicted most strongly their outcome was their expectation of positive outcome and so the people in session number one on day one before they had any treatment said yeah i think i'm going to get better guess what they're the ones who got better and so um you know that doesn't establish causation it doesn't establish that though that if we just can convince those people that they'll get better they will mm. but it 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 suggests that it's a possibility mm. right so i think um, we should absolutely give our clients realistic expectations, but we should give them, we should err on the side of optimism mm. with our realistic expectations. Absolutely. Yeah. 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 Good talk. Yeah. So, um, so we, when it comes back, when it comes to shoulder pain, mm-hmm. sex. <laughs> <laughs> Just some kind of exercise. <laughs> Just anything, right? <laughs> And give them some positive expectations. You know, give them some realistic I'm, but positive I'm expectations. Imagine the little, like, <laughs> copyright symbol <laughs> next to that. Sex. Sex. Copyright. TM, yeah. Yes, yeah, trademark TM. <laughs> Are we getting T-shirts printed? Yeah, and we've got to make some kind of little special shoulder exercise uh, <laughs> implement. <laughs> In fact, it could be like a, a shoulder female empowerment product or something like that. Oh, my God. <laughs> I've seen, I'm seeing we haven't a, talked about that for a while. I'm seeing a lucrative commercial partnership. You know, I got another <laughs> another company reach out to me. Really? Yes. So another one. Ano- like, what's... It's only going to... I've only got gonna, a kid in everyone. I don't need... It's fine. I'm like happy. <laughs> I'm like... <laughs> I've got company. <laughs> it's like... <laughs> <laughs> okay, right. wow. This is just going downhill now. But, all, right. Um, so, so, all right. So someone comes to you with shoulder pain. <laughs> don't... Don't bother about assessing their scapular mechanics, no. right? It's not a thing. No. Talk about their goals, what's important yeah. to them. Talk about what their expectations are and tell them that great news, most people with shoulder pain make a full recovery within a year, right? Mm-hmm. All we've got to do is get you moving and get you strengthening up. 
Mm-hmm. So let's get going. Do some push-ups. Go. Mm-hmm. Right? Sex. Something that's some, like some kind of exercise <laughs> some for the shoulder. Kind of exercise. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. If yeah. they've got the shits, give them yeah. sex. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, good talk. <laughs> Thanks, Brad.